that it's not uncommon for people who are elected to the Imperial Senate uh, in the former general or federal government in Washington, D.C., really tend to have a life term. They're there for the entirety of their life. And would you be surprised to learn that this was exactly what there were a number of people warned would happen, primarily on the anti-federalist side during the ratification debates. But it's not for the reason that most people think. And it's the solution isn't as simple as just getting one amendment dealt with. And I think uh, addressing some of the underlying concerns or actually understanding them is the first step on a road to, I guess, recovery. And I want to kick this off, first of all, with pointing to Federalist Paper number 62, which I think is the uh, the simplest overview, and I've got a little bit more, of why we have the structure of the Senate as it is, how it's supposed to be, what the goal was supposed to be. And I think the goal is correct. Whether they implemented it properly or not is another story. And I think hearing the other side of the the debate is very helpful here. But first, Federalist 62, uh, we don't know for sure who wrote this. There's a few of them that are disputed. This one's probably Madison, but could be Hamilton, too. The equal vote allowed to each state is at once a constitutional recognition of the portion of sovereignty remaining in the individual states and an instrument for preserving that residuary sovereignty, the idea of having each state being represented Equally in the Senate, in the Congress, is a representation of the state's interest. This isn't supposed to be a popular kind of election type of thing, and that's why they were chosen by state legislatures. And it also uh, gives us uh, some support for federalism, because if it's each state represented one to one, it doesn't matter how much population or how little. There was some debate over that as well. But that is a federal or a confederated approach, at least in mentality. Fisher Ames put it this way in the Massachusetts Ratifying Convention, January 1788. The senators will represent the sovereignty of the states. The representatives are to represent the people. And there's supposed to be a balance uh, a balance between the two kind of checking each other off because they were different approaches. Now, there were three main reasons that in practice, the anti-federalists warned we'd get something different despite this intention of having the Senate represent the sovereignties of the states. They said it was going to be completely different. And the first one on that is that they were going to be in office for too long. Now, anti-federalists didn't necessarily call for term limits. I know a lot of people just want to think that, oh, okay, we just need to swap them out every couple of years and everything will be fine. They didn't necessarily call for that, but they did call for things like a rotation, for example, uh, six years. They said if we're going to do six years, they should be eligible for six, but not the next six, and then they can come back. So they weren't perpetually out of office or shorter terms, just more often, more common, maybe four years or two years or uh, every year some people wanted. Some people did suggest a hard limit, but in general, the the idea was that they were going to be in office too long. The Federalists, of course, made a very valid point in response to that. Here's Robert Livingston, the chancellor in the New York Ratifying Convention, June of 1788. The people are the best judges who ought to represent them, to dictate and control them, to tell them who they shall not elect, is to abridge their natural rights. This rotation, he's specifically talking about a proposal in the New York Ratifying Convention to do something similar to what they had in the Articles of Confederation. That is, you're eligible for a certain amount of time, then you're ineligible, then you can come back, basically to shuffle people in and out. But he said this rotation is an absurd species of ostracism, a mode of proscribing eminent merit and banishing from stations of trust those who have filled them with the greatest faithfulness. Now, that... Uh, that may not be how it plays out in practice, but the idea that the people have the, the the final say, this is an abridgment of the natural rights of them through their representatives in their state governments, at least at that time, I think that summed up the Federalist approach pretty well. But the Anti-Federalists weren't really buying it. Mercy Otis Warren, for example, in her observations on the new Constitution, she said, you know, just being in office this long— they're going to end up there for life, and that's how she put it. A Senate chosen for six years will, in most instance, instances, be an appointment for life. She was far from alone. This was a very common anti-federalist view. She may have been the uh, most plain spoken in this, but they gave reasons why. And here's how Mercy explained it. As the influence of such a body over the minds of the people will be co-equal to the extensive powers with which they are vested, and they will not only forget, but be forgotten by their constituents. 
a branch of the Supreme Legislature thus set beyond all responsibility is totally repugnant to every principle of a free government. So kind of a permanent a permanent kind of elected despotism, elective despotism, something that Jefferson, Richard Henry Lee, and others warned against. Thomas Jefferson was on board with the idea of a rotation, although he recognized that he lost that argument. Uh, people didn't actually get on board with it. But here's Melanchthon Smith, also in the New York Ratifying Convention, debating back and forth with Livingston, talking about this as well, and Hamilton. He actually agrees with Hamilton here, first of all. We can't always disagree with Hamilton. I know it's kind of easy to do a knee-jerk reaction, and contrarian on this, but he points out at the beginning of his speech, I concur with the Honorable gen Gentleman, that's Alexander Hamilton, that there is a necessity for giving this branch a greater stability than the House of Representatives. The argu argument is they're involved in much more, I guess, sensitive type of things, involved in some form policy, treaty-making type of stuff. And therefore, uh, it takes more time to actually do that. And the more stability you have, the more that you can assure other countries that there isn't always a convulsion. And that was the argument. And a lot of people agreed on that. And even if they were going to say, hey, uh, we don't like six-year terms, we want something different to have a balance. And that's how Melanchthon Smith approached this. He said, declaring them ineligible during a certain term after six years, not hard limit forever, like you can never come back, but basically just get out of office for a while, do something in the private sector, come back later. De declaring them ineligible during a certain term after six years is far from rendering them less stable than is necessary. We think the amendment will place the Senate in a proper medium between a fluctuating and a perpetual body. And we have to understand that the prediction was because of the long terms, they would forget their role. They would become more attached. They'd be living in the capital city and they'd be, become part of that kind of establishment class, a form of a permanent or a baneful aristocracy is how they were described. And they would just not really any more pay attention to their states or their needs. And there was, and I'll get into this as well, there was no way to get rid of them beyond the normal election process, really. He said, as the clause now stands, there is no doubt that the senators will hold their office perpetually. And in this situation, they must of necessity lose their dependence and attachment to the people. And that's a little bit more detailed explanation of how Mercy Otis Warren put it. Here's George Mason down in Virginia, uh, June 13th, 1788. He said, in the new constitution, instead of being elected for one year, and of course we know that Mason was on board with much more frequent elections, they are chosen for six years. They cannot be recalled in all that time for any misconduct. And at the end of that long term, may again be elected. What will be the operation of this? Is it not probable that those gentlemen will be elected, who will be elected senators will fix themselves in the federal town and become citizens of that town more than that of our state? We think of this, this inside the beltway mentality, even of organizations professing to support the Constitution and Liberty, they get this mentality that uh, everything is around the federal center. And Mason was warning and so many others, Warren and Melanchthon Smith and a few others that I'll get to here in a little bit, John Lansing and others, they're basically saying that the longer that they're there surrounded by the pillars of power, the more that they would be willing to be like this. Now, Mercy Otis Warren in her great history of the American Revolution actually railed on John Adams for this very thing. Uh, this was kind of a, an understanding throughout history. So John Adams was the Atlas of Independence. She talked about how before the uh, before the revolution, or during the revolution, and before the war for independence, he was one of the most reliable supporters of liberty, and he was so trusted. But then he spent a lot of time in Europe, and he was around kind of the um, the kingly approach of things. And she said he came back tainted, and by the time he was president, he acted more like a monarch. So he went he went from revolutionary to monarchists. And this is the type of stuff that people saw. Now, this hadn't played out yet with John Adams at this point, but this is something that the anti-Federalists, I think, really held on to. They understood. Uh, going further, George Mason put it this way, they will be a continually existing body. They will exercise those machinations and contrivances which the many have always to fear from the few. So what George Mason is getting at here, this long-term 
coupled with a lack of a recall power in the Constitution, really creates a permanence in office because there's no way to really keep them in check. If they're supposed to be representing the states, the state can't do anything until six years are up. And, well, then, of course, you get into the, well, we don't want this worst person in office, and it always becomes this drive to a lesser of two evils, a race to the bottom. And the recall power that they're talking about is actually referencing something that they had lived under, under the Articles of Confederation. This is in Article 5. It says specifically, a power reserved to each state to recall its delegates or any of them at any time within the year and to send others in their stead for the remainder of the year. This is literally what they were used to. And they thought this was proper because if you were going to delegate someone the power to do something for you as they are your agent... You can call back your agent in any other scenario, but not for the states, not for the states under the Constitution. And the anti-federalists were very concerned. That's our number two uh, main issue that the anti-federalists warned about was that there was no power of recall. If you're supposed to represent a state, you're not truly representing the state. You're ruling over the state for a period of time with an option to choose a different ruler, kind of an elective despotism, if the state can't say, well, we don't like what you're doing. You're out of there. Now, mind you, here's also the the rotation. I just wanted to read this as well here in the Articles of Confederation. Again, Article 5, no person shall be capable of being delegate for more than three years in any term of six years. So the suggestion was, okay, we're agreeing with you, Hamilton, Morris, and others that, uh, well, not Morris in the ratification debates, but Hamilton Wilson, for example, We agree with you that there should be more stability in the more aristocratic branch, not a permanent aristocracy, which are different. We agree with you that there should be more permanency to it, but not permanency. More more stability is the term that they actually used. Now, here's John Lansing discussing this uh, power, a lack of a power of recall again in the New York ratifying convention. He said the idea of rotation has been taken from the articles of the old confederation. It has thus far, in my opinion, operated with great advantage. The power of recall, too, has been another excellent check, though it has, in fact, never been exercised. Merely, this is like the right to keep and bear arms, the right of self-defense. You don't want, you could literally just uh, deter crime by having someone think that everyone is armed, even if they're not. That's how you can help because they're not sure if they're going to use the check. If the check is available to be used against somebody, then maybe it will be. And so if there is no check, they can act different ways. They change. They can sometimes act with almost impunity. And he said, even though it's never been exercised, I think it has been a powerful check. The thing is of so delicate a nature that few men will step forward to move a recall unless there is some strong ground for it. So he liked it. And Melanchthon Smith liked it as well. He said, I would observe that as the senators are the representatives of the state legislatures, it is reasonable and proper that they should be under their control. So if you're going to have a true federal system, if they are actually representing, if you're going to have like base closer to a confederation rather than more of a consolidated or partly national approach, Then, of course, if you're representing states, then states can return or call back their delegates. So that's the argument that they were making. He said, when a state sends an agent commissioned to transact any business or perform any service, it certainly ought to have a power to recall him. And that was a pretty common anti-federalist view. For example, Patrick Henry took this approach as well. Uh, This was June 12th, I think. June 12th, 1788. We're going to link to this stuff in the show notes. Uh, uh, Alan Mosley has been organizing the blog post for these, and I'm very grateful for that. He's freeing up a bunch of time for me and doing an awesome job in getting these put together. And we generally get that all set and published within a couple hours after the live stream is done. And I should mention that uh, 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty is where you're going to find that. You're going to find also on each individual blog post for every episode, you're going to find all the different platforms we're on. You'll also find that show link section where you can say, hey, Bolden, where was that uh, speech from Patrick Henry? And that will be included there as well. And I should take a quick moment to say hello to everyone out in the live chat. I appreciate you guys being here. White Bearded Gnu talks about the 17th Amendment. I'm going to get to that in a moment as well. Captain Volt, uh, Kirk Morrison, Tim, King Nobody, Haji. Uh, who else am I? So C&T Designs and Arms. That's a great screen name. Senator D.T., 
and everyone else. I appreciate you guys being here. There's Dixie Strong and Larry Clark, Cheriton Farmer. Thank you so much for watching or listening, whether this is your first episode or you've been here for every single one since day one. Again, 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty is where you're going to find the blog post for this episode and the show notes with all the reference links. Here's Patrick Henry, Virginia Ratifying Convention. At present, at present, president, at present, you may appeal to the voice of the people and send men to Congress positively instructed to obey your direction. You can recall them if their system of policy be ruinous. So they were just saying, hey, if you guys are not following our instructions, we're sending you as a delegate. This is more of a mentality going back to the American Revolution. If you think about the Continental Congress, if you sent delegates or if you sent delegates to meet with another country, really, you would always, and of course, we're thinking of the states as free, independent, and sovereign states in a voluntary union. If that's what it's supposed to be, then those sovereign states, representing really the sovereignty of the people of each state, they could make a decision to recall their representatives anytime they want. And if the states are representing uh, represented by the two senators, then they can be pulled and withdrawn anytime they want. Of course, in the Articles of Confederation, that's what they had. So this was the argument. Hey, why are you trashing this part of the system? It seems like you really are trying to transform this into a consolidated government. Uh, and that's what Patrick Henry's getting at. Look, if we've got a problem with someone we send, we can get them out of there. Now they're telling us we can't do that anymore. So our, is our state really represented or is this more of a national approach, a more consolidated approach? He said, but can you in this government recall your senators or can you instruct them? You cannot recall them. You may instruct them and offer your opinions, but if they think they am, them improper, they may disregard them. If they give away or sacrifice your most valuable rights, can you impeach or punish them? No. So Patrick Henry's warning that, well, they're going to get away with all kinds of nasty stuff. And that's what Luther Martin said earlier that year in Genuine Information Number 4. He said, thus, sir, for six years, the senators are rendered totally and absolutely independent of their states. So if the goal was to have them represent the states, the anti-federalists are saying, well, that may be the goal, but in practice, they are going to be independent. They will not have to represent their state, only if they're good people. And ultimately, this is an argument about, well, can we trust people with power to do what they promise? Can we trust people with power to be good men? to be good women, to be good people, to follow the rules because they're just good people. And, and there's a lot of maxims on human nature and the like here. People are corrupted. People are cor easy to corrupt. And power always seeks to expand and grow. And so if you understand this, then just choosing them every six years, the anti-federalists are saying, this is not representing the states. It's actually totally independent of the states. So it fails to the anti-federalists to be part of a federal system. Again, for six years, the senators are rendered totally and absolutely independent of their states, wrote Luther Martin, of whom they ought to be the representatives without any bond or tie between them. During that time, they may join in measures ruinous and destructive to their states, even such as should totally annihilate their state governments, and their states cannot recall them nor exercise any control over them. So this is no longer a union of independent states, according to the Anti-Federalists, because the states are no longer independent if they can't recall the people who are supposed to represent them. That is a very, very straightforward point. Whether you think it's correct or not, I think it's very interesting. And the third issue that they really get at is too much uh, of a mixture or blending of powers. They really, really, everyone at the founding recognized that um, uh, consolidation of powers, legislative, executive, and judicial, destroys liberty. Now, the Federalist side said you can kind of do it. The Anti-Federalist side said you can't ever do it. If you do, you're going to end up with consolidation. And here from the, uh, the Senate, the Center for the Study of the American Constitution at the University of Wisconsin, which has got a lot of great resources, they describe it this, like this. Additional concerns focused on the Senate's blended functions with the executive branch in appointments and making treaties. 
For anti-federalists, this was a lack of a separation of powers between the branches of government. We hear all the time there's a separation of powers, executive, legislative, and judicial. But the Senate, even the federal federalists pointed out there was a blending there. The argument, though, was, well, you can get away with some blending of these powers. You just can't have too much. And so that creates kind of a gray area that the anti-federalists didn't like. And going further, they write, additional concerns centered on the placement of the vice president. People like, I think it was George Mason said, this is an un. they didn't even want the vice president. They thought it was an unnecessary officer. Additional concerns centered on the placement of the vice president as the president of the Senate with voting powers in the event of a deadlock. They thought that was also a blending of the two branches. Anti-Federalists were also critical of the Senate's role in trying cases of impeachment. This is also giving a judicial power to the Senate. They thought that was a blending of powers. Now, you could disagree and say, well, this is legit. Madison and others were thought this was cool, so they were correct. But the fact is, this was the argument. They took the position that you just can't blend any powers. Because of the Senate's power to confirm appointments, anti-federalists speculated the Senate would not convict anyone who was impeached. They would consider each other more like husband and wife. They'd be part of the same team. And if one person did something wrong, well especially if they were of the same party over time, you wouldn't ever find, we hear this talk, talked about today, if you don't have party control of both houses, you can't get impeachment because they're kind of tied together. And maybe it's more of a partisan thing, a faction thing than anything, but it certainly exists. Here's Sentinel in his second Anti-Federalist paper describing this, uh, this view. He said, this mixture of the legislative and executive, moreover, highly tends to corruption. Again, the anti-federalists warned that a mixture of powers in the Senate, now elsewhere as well, but specifically in the Senate, would lead to corruption. Were they correct? There sure is a lot of power and corruption in that body. The chief improvement in government in modern times, he wrote, has been the complete separation of the great distinctions of power, placing the legislative in different hands from the, those which hold the executive and again, severing the judicial part from the ordinary administrative. And of course, here he's referencing the celebrated Montesquieu, who wrote in The Spirit of the Laws in 1740. This is a guy who was cited over and over and over in the ratification debates. There can be no liberty where the legislative and executive powers are united in the same person or body of magistrates. So if you combine these... You're going to have no liberty. And that was what they were they were basing as their foundation. Again, Federalists like James Madison said you could have some as long as it wasn't a complete consolidation of power. Here's a sentinel again in that same paper uh, talking about the Senate possessing a considerable share in the executive as well as a legislative. It would become a permanent aristocracy and swallow up the other orders in the government. Now, the Federalists vehemently rejected the notion that the Senate would become either a baneful or a permanent aristocracy. These were the arguments. Now, they certainly took the position that it was the more aristocratic. It had some features, but an aristocracy that never ended is a totally different story. And the Federalists really spent a lot of time responding to that argument because it must have had a lot of legs, or at least it had a, must have had a lot of legs in the ratification debate. So they had to convince the opposition that this was absurd. Now, here in Federalist number 63, again, we don't know who wrote this one. I lean towards Hamilton based on my reading, but I am definitely not the expert. More, pe more historians tend to think this was, uh, this was Madison. And here's how they put it. The jealous adversary of the Constitution will probably content himself repeating that a Senate appointed not immediately by the people and for the term of six years must gradually acquire a dangerous preeminence in the government and finally transform it into a tyrannical aristocracy. So they recognized they literally had to take one of the big arguments against the against ratification of the Constitution, and they specifically addressed it there in the Federalist Papers and elsewhere. James Wilson talked about it as well in his far more influential State House Yard speech in October of 1787. But certainly here in the Federalist Papers, which so many people cite today, maybe too much, maybe I do too much, 
but they specifically are addressing this attack because they were responding to things that were threatening ratification success. And this is one of them. And they conclude that paper in Federalist 63 with this. Besides the conclusive evidence resulting from this assemblage of facts, and you can read the whole thing again, it'll be a link to in the show notes, you can see the entire response. The federal Senate will never be able to transform itself by gradual usurpations into an independent and aristocratic body. So here in the Federalist Papers, whether it's Hamilton or Madison, or maybe they worked on it together, uh, we know that they're basically saying that no chance, it's not going to happen. And that's what James Wilson said in his State House Yard speech again, October 6, 1787. Perhaps there never was a charge made with less reasons than that which predicts the institution of a baneful aristocracy in the federal Senate. This body branches into two characters, the one legislative and the other executive. And then he goes on to describe these two characters. He doesn't address the judicial part, though. Now, Cincinnati, in his anti-federalist papers, his papers weren't just an essay addressed to generally to the people. These were specifically addressed to Mr. James Wilson. So Cincinnatus number four in November of 1787 to James Wilson, Esquire. He's recognizing that Wilson is arguing against this idea uh, that uh, the Senate would turn into a permanent or baneful aristocracy. And he says, the whole truth then is that the same body called the Senate is vested with legislative, executive, and judicial powers. It has all three of these that we're not supposed to combine in the same body of men. The first two you acknowledge. So this was a very powerful uh, letter here that was published in November of 1787. I think a lot of people really kind of ran with this because, look, we all agree that uh, Montesquieu was correct. What that meant, though, was what the debate was. And you're acknowledging that two of the things we're not supposed to combine in the same body, you've actually just done. He said the last is conveyed in these three in these words, section th- three, the Senate shall have the sole power to try all impeachments. So Wilson and others are saying, no, uh, this it's not going to be an aristocracy. It's not going to be a problem. And then we're combining these two powers and the anti-federalists are saying, well, no, you can't actually do this. Cincinnati actually called the Senate the most exceptional part, exceptional part of the Constitution, the worst part of the Constitution. And here he is again. He said, in the Constitution of the Senate, there is so much cunning and little wisdom that we have much to fear from it and little to hope, and then it must necessarily produce a baneful aristocracy. And I think James Wilson, probably due to some of these responses, he actually backed down a little bit. He backpedaled a little bit in the Pennsylvania Ratifying Convention in December of 1787, specifically pointed out that I am not a blind admirer of this system. Some of the powers of the senator's are not with me the favorite parts of it. So, I mean, it's kind of a soft backpedal, but he's basically saying, look, okay, I'm with you. I'm not totally cool with exactly how they structured the Senate, but here's the reason why we should ratify anyways. And even John Adams, in a letter to Cotton Tufts in 1788, was asked, he said, you are pleased to ask my poor opinion of the new Constitution, and I have no hesitation to give it. And here's the entirety of his opinion on the proposed Constitution during the ratification debates in Massachusetts. Now, he wasn't there, but here he is writing about it. This is entire a view of the Constitution. I am much mortified at the mixture of legislative and executive powers in the Senate and wish for some other amendments. What do you think of this uh, Constitution? Well, I'm mortified, mortified at the mixture of legislative and executive powers in the Senate. And you couldn't be more Federalist in some ways than John Adams. Now, even James Madison, I mentioned I would talk about the 17th Amendment, but just briefly here. Now, even James Madison, who went to very great lengths in uh, the Virginia Ratifying Convention, specifically debating with people like Patrick Henry and George Mason, he went to great lengths to show that the Constitution would not lead to a the kind of consolidation that uh, Montesquieu warned would destroy liberty, create this kind of permanent or baneful aristocracy in that body. But he acknowledged that the reason that everything was cool, and he specifically said this, was the mode of choosing the Senate, which was the state legislatures, That would prevent that type of consolidation and destruction of liberty. And so here he is. This is on June 6th, 1788. 
again in the Virginia ratifying convention, he's responding to Patrick Henry, who spent two days attacking the system as, well, this is going to be a centralized, consolidated government. It will destroy liberty. We're either going to have liberty or an empire, but we can't have both. And so Madison is responding to him, and here's how he put it. I can say, notwithstanding what the honorable gentleman has alleged, that this government is not completely consolidated, nor is it entirely federal. So he's saying you can have kind of a mix. It can be partly consolidated and partly a confederation. And we can get away with mixing some of these powers because we have a, a, a kind of a safety valve in there. And that's how the senators are chosen. You'll hear that in just a moment. Who are, well, let me start that over. I can say, notwithstanding what the honorable gentleman has alleged, that this government is not completely consolidated, nor is it entirely federal. Who are parties to it? The people. But not the people as composing one great body, but the people as composing 13 sovereignties. Were it as the gentleman asserts a consolidated government, the assent of a majority of the people would be sufficient for its establishment. So he's saying the mode of ratification tells us we're not totally consolidated. But here's another caveat for today. He said, but had the government been completely consolidated, the Senate would have been chosen by the people in their individual capacity in the same manner as the members of the other House. So popular elections of the Senate, according to James Madison, would have been the final nail in the coffin that would have created a completely consolidated government that would guarantee destroy liberty. And that's exactly what we got with the 17th Amendment. 1913 was an absolutely terrible year for liberty. Well, I hope you guys found this interesting. I hope it's educational. There's a lot to think about. I think the solutions are not as straightforward as what a lot of people would like you to believe. Ultimately, really, it gets down to a population that loves liberty and is willing to do what it takes to defend it, whether the government likes it or not. And again, if you want to help us reach and teach more people with this kind of education, this type of history, this type of strategy and the like, there's nothing that helps us do this work more than the financial faith and support of our members. You can join us over at 10th Amendment Center .com members. If you've got a couple of bucks of that dirty government fiat monthly membership start out just two dollars. And of course, <laughs> the purchasing power that two bucks keeps going down. But we no one, no one makes those couple of dollars of dirty government empire fiat go further than us here at the 10th Amendment Center. We also have annual five year and lifetime options. Again, 10th Amendment Center .com slash members. I'll take a look over in the comments and see if there's any quick questions I can get back to. I just have a minute or so more. Uh, John missed his notification, but good to see you. Glad you made it. Uh, not seeing any questions here that I can get back to, but I'll read it a little closer later today or tomorrow. I get a lot of great ideas for future episodes. Sometimes someone points out something where I was way off base and that's very helpful as well, or maybe they needed some clarification. I didn't good, do a good job uh, communicating things. So if you've got questions, comments, feedback, suggestions, you can leave it in the comments, especially the archive at places like YouTube, Rumble, Odyssey, uh, or you can email me team at 10th amendment center.com. Again, a lot of meat in this info, a lot of, in this episode, a lot of information here. I hope it was enjoyable. I really enjoyed putting this together to share with you. I'm learning as I go as well here. I'm uh, picking up new information every time I study this. So I really appreciate the opportunity to share it with you. I hope to see you. I hope you have a great day and I hope to see you next time here on the path to Liberty.